Hello, this is E637. E I'm Charlie Bowman, and uh, today we're going to just finish up some of the work we've been doing in segmentation and, uh, and uh, clustering, and then we're going to move briskly along to the topic of color imaging. In fact, what lab is due at the end of this week? No, no, no. Next week. Oh. Oh. So why are we, oh, because what was the, well, what's the lab do next week? Color. Oh, I guess this is a two-week lab yeah. because it's a little bit more intensive. Okay, um, good. So, um, but I, yeah, I want to cover some of that before that lab is due because uh, I think that would be helpful. So I think uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the electronic notes today uh, to do the, uh, uh, finish up this material. So here we've, we've talked about this, uh, this uh, 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 splitting and merging and hierarchical clustering. And then we talked about how you want to uh, often when you do segmentations you use, you use uh, some kind of feature vector. And the feature vector, rather than using all the information from the, uh, the uh, object because it's too much to deal with, you summarize it as a feature vector. And the feature vector can encapsulate information about things like color or texture or shape or really anything. Uh, so uh, the idea is that the feature vector is some uh, function of the actual uh, region itself. So R sub n here takes is the nth region. So a partitioning of the, of the image into regions means that the regions, uh, the union of all the regions is, uh, is the entire image and that the intersection between any two regions is empty, right? That's the definition of a partitioning is that uh, you've separated uh, all the pixels into uh, distinct sets, and every pixel belongs to one of the sets, and only one. So, okay, so here for each region, then you apply some function, you extract a, a, a k-dimensional vector. Now remember, the, the dimensionality of the region varies depending upon the size of the region. But the dimensionality of this feature vector is fixed, usually. So um, then the idea is that hopefully you design this feature vector so that if you merge two regions, so let's say you take the kth and the lth region and you merge them together into a new region, then the feature vector for the new region uh, can be computed as a function of the two feature vectors for the original two regions. In general, that's not the case, because in general what can happen is if you merge two regions, somehow you, have, you may need to go back to the original data, look at all the pixels in those two regions. It could even be a function of pixels outside of those regions, for that matter, um, and, and sort of reevaluate all that information again. But it's a simplifying assumption which is, makes it much easier to deal with is to assume that the feature vectors of the regions contain all the information necessary to calculate what the new feature vector should be. If that's the case, then, and then, then it's simpler to do the clustering. And, and the clustering can be thought of as just an operation that performs on the feature vectors themselves. So um, here's an example to illustrate that. So, what I'm saying to this point may have been sort of abstract, so here's a concrete example where you can see how this can work out. So if you have a, a, a feature, uh, so your feature vector is maybe a three-dimensional quantity. The first dimension is the number of pixels in the region. The second dimension is the average color of the region. So x here could be a vector, in which case this w mu here would be a vector, or it could be a scalar. Um, and then CK here is uh, the uh, centroid of the region. So you take the actual location of each pixel, you take the average of the locations of the pixels, the center of the, of the locations will be the uh, centroid of the region. Okay. So this tells you something about where the region is located. So here you have the, the size of the region, the average color of the region, the, the, the center of, uh, of the location of the region. And then um, if you merge two regions, well, you could go back and recompute these values, but you don't need to because you can compute the feature vector for the merged region from the feature vectors for each of the individual regions. And to do that, uh, hmm, well, let me see. I have, oh, here's the calculation. Uh, so this, I mean, you'd have to verify this. 
Oh, hold on for a second. How do? Uh, uh, hold on. I guess I didn't really. Hmm. Oh, here's the calculation. It's right here. Okay. Okay. So the new, the new, the number of pixels in the merged region is the sum of the pixels in each of the regions, right? That's pretty obvious. The average gray level in the new region is the weighted average of the gray levels for each of the two regions. That, that you'd have to verify, but it's true. And the weights are associated with the relative number of pixels. So if the, each region was of the same size, then it would be just the average of the two gray levels. But if one, so if one region's larger than the other, then you'll weight that more heavily. This gives you the same answer you would get if you calculated it directly from the pixels of the region. And, and the uh, centroid is a weighted average in the, center, uh, the centers of the two regions. So you don't need to go all the way back to the original pixels. So this is the recursion which allows you to calculate the feature vector for the merged region. Okay, now, now the idea is that you define some distance measure on these feature vectors. So you, we have a distance measure on the regions, but the way you calculate it is only as a function of the, of the feature vectors. And now the idea is that the distance measure is larger when the regions are more dissimilar, and they're, um, it's smaller when the regions are more similar. So you merge the most similar regions first. So what you do is you search over all pairs of KL regions until you find the two most similar with the smallest distance. And then you take those two regions and you merge them into a single region, all right? How many comparisons, do you, how many calculations of this distance do you have to do in order to, to, to compare all, two, all regions? You have to do, here, let, let me actually draw that. Uh, can we switch to the piece of paper? Because this comes up a lot, okay? If you have, um, so this is the matrix, which is D, L, K, say. So this, this index here is L, and this index here is K. Okay, so uh, you don't, you never have to compare the distance of a region to itself, right? So you don't care about the diagonal. So I'll draw the diagonal. Okay, you don't care about that. And remember, DLK is for a symmetric distance, which typically they are. DLK is equal to DKL. If the if the if the the distance is not symmetric, then you typically need to symmetrize it anyway, because otherwise it, there's no real logic to, to saying that DLK equals something other than DKL. I mean, there are some legitimate measures of dissimilarity that aren't uh, symmetric, the most notable being the callback liebler distance, but there, usually you have to take it and, and do something to symmetrize it or or it's a little bit nonsensical. So, so these are, you only have to check all these values. All these values up here, you have to check to find which one's smallest. So, um, so to do that, the, no, the total number of entries in a matrix, it's of n by n, right? So how many, uh, I better check, be consistent in my notation. How many regions did we have? I think we had n regions, didn't we? Uh, I'm still looking for my notation. Maybe I can make up any variable I want because maybe I didn't define it. Okay, so let's. I don't think I have a variable here. Let's say. Let's say there. Are, this is. Uh, this matrix here is M by M. Okay. So how many entries are in, it's a symmetric matrix, and it's diagonal zero, because the distance between, by definition, we'll just define the distance between any two regions that are the same as zero, but we sort of ignore the diagonal. So how many entries are in the matrix total? Unique. Well, not unique, just total number of entries. It's a trivial question. Well, okay, you're being too sophisticated. I want a dumber answer. M squared. <laughs> Okay, just the number of entries. Okay, you're jumping ahead. Okay, your answer's good. It's it's just not the one I was looking for. Okay, so m squared. Okay, so now how many entries are in the diagonal? There's m on the diagonal, right? 
So the non-diagonal entries are m squared minus m, right? And these are equal to these, so we only check the upper triangle, right? So that's over 2, right? So the, so, um, so the answer is that it's m times m minus 1 over 2, okay? which is actually uh, m choose 2, right? I think I wrote that correctly. You put the choose on the bottom, right? Oh, is, okay, so m choose 2. It's a number of ways you can uniquely choose uh, two unordered things from a set of m things, right? Yeah, which is also like if you... Uh, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's good enough. I just want to... So that's a standard counting thing that comes up a lot. So going back to the computer... Uh, when you have to, if you want to find, if you want to find the um, distance, which is the smallest distance, how many things do you have to check? M times m minus one over two. So that's order m squared, because it increases as with m squared. So if the number of regions is large, this can be slow. But so that's the key uh, problem. You got to find. Um, you got to find the uh, the two that are, uh, are 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 closest together. Let's see. Okay, so uh, you find the two that are closest together, and you merge those two, uh, and then you recurse. Okay, you you apply the same thing. And then here's an example where we have uh, example of uh, you have a uh, color mean, and then you have uh, uh, oh this is this, here's a distance measure between the feature vector I described. So you take the distance between the colors and you have the distance between the uh, 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 the uh, centroids and you have the distance between uh, and well that's and then you add you you basically have some weights that determine how important those two things are, right? Hmm? Um, this, uh, the number of it, it depends on the uh, Depends on where we start and the shape um, of the mirror. Not for this. So, so what you're saying here is that okay. So in this application, the answer that's not the case. Okay. So I, I sort of know what you're saying, and there's something closely related which is true. But we have this merging hour. So we define the distance. Uh, that merge the regions with minimum distance, okay? So you start off with some regions, right? Typically, the, the minimum distance pair is unique. I mean, it's possible that two different pairs might have the same distance. The minimum might not be unique, right? But usually it is. So there's a unique minimum, and then you merge those two. And then you repeat. You find the next unique minimum you merge. So that process is uh, unique. Uh, uh, as long as every time you go to look for the minimum, the minimum is unique. And, and each time you're finding the global minimum, because you search all m, minus m, m times m minus 1 over 2 pairs, you just, usually it's not prohibitively computationally expensive to just do a global search of all uh, pairs because it's order m squared, which is usually not too bad. But there's but what that doesn't do is guarantee that you've found the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, partitioning which minimizes some global cost function. If there's a global cost function you're trying to minimize, and some of these cost functions do correspond to the greedy minimization of some global cost function then this greedy minimization will not uniquely minimize the global cost function. I think that's what you're thinking. So, but, but, what, but it is the case that the greedy optimization is itself unique. In other words, there's only a, it's typically only one choice. Okay, so, uh, so the picture you get looks like, the, looks like this. Okay, so here's the algorithm, right? So you evaluate the differ, this distance between every pair then you find the pair that have the minimum distance, okay? Then what you do is you merge those two regions and you remove, um, 
You remove one of the two regions from the, from the set. Okay. See, basically, what happens is you 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 take one of those two regions, you replace it with the merge region, and the other one you delete. Then you then there's an efficient way of updating this thing without having to recompute all of the uh, the entries. As a matter of fact, uh, if we if we go back to the piece of paper. So what happens is that you have this matrix of distances. So this is DKL, right? You're only concerned about the upper triangular part of it. So let's say this is entry K and this is entry L. And then this is This is K, and this is L. Like that, OK? So what will happen is that the only entries that will be affected by the updating of the K and L, when you change the regions K and L, so if you have some, some other point here, I and J, where I and J are not equal to K or L, then none of these points will change. So the only points you have to update in the matrix are the, are the basically, you only have to uh, update the points that I've made in black here. Because those are the only entries that will be wrong. All the other entries stayed the same. And this part here, you just ignore. This is don't care. You just leave the net empty, right? You don't, you don't even need to store zeros there. You can use a sparse matrix structure. So it's a little bit tricky when you write the code to do this sort of thing because uh, you could just re-compute the entire matrix, the, basically the upper triangular part of the matrix every time. But it's a lot of wasted computation because to do that is order m squared, right? And if you have to do that, so you have to, how many merges do you have to do? Every time you do a merge, uh, you get rid of one of these things. So you're going to mer merge order m times so that you have to multiply that. You'd have to do that m times, okay? So that would equal m cubed, okay? So m cubed is a lot of computation. So to do this update here, you can do this update in order uh, 2m, which is the same thing as order m, because the length of these lines, if you take this line and stretch it out, it's really of length m, and there's two of them. So it's 2m times m, so that's order m squared. So that algorithm is a lot faster. Yeah, yeah, you have a question? So when you yeah, do this, taking advantage of this if you go from m to m minus 1, do you have to change the size of the matrix? Do you have to drop a row and a column? Uh, yes. So what, the, yes, basically what you do is you have to strike, you have to strike one of them. So you can either do that or you can, um, you know, store something there so you don't have to search it. So, so I'm ignoring some constants here, but but uh, uh, but the the final order is. I mean, so so by being by reducing the size of the matrix, right? Then every time you do the update, it'll get faster. But it doesn't change the order of the calculation. So it's worth doing. It makes it like twice as fast or three times as fast. But it doesn't change the order of the calculation. Because uh, just like in the same way that using the upper triangular part of the matrix doesn't reduce the order of the complexity. It just reduces it by half. And you know, hey, half is important in a lot of applications. But, but it's not, um, for, but a computer scientist would say that the complexity is the same. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm just pointing this out. Because if you ever have to implement that, I'm sure you can go to Google, Wikipedia, and uh, they probably have the algorithm for this. I don't it's a pretty standard thing to do. So going back to the computer, uh, when you do this, uh, you get this kind of a thing. So this is called uh, agglomerative clustering. And um, uh, let's see. Let me make it just a little bit smaller. Uh, this is <coughs> and um, uh, yeah, there's actually a name for this diagram, and I keep meaning to go look it up. It's, I think it's called the dendrite uh, graph or something. And then, um, so what happens is that you take 
uh, you find the two closest thing, you merge them. Then you find the two closest things, you merge them. Now, when you find the next two closest things, what you may find, the way I drew it here, um, oh, here, okay, here you merge these two together, and, and then it turns out the next thing you merge is with another one, uh, with that one again, right? Mm -hmm. So it can happen in, in various orders. Now, depending upon what your criteria is, sometimes it'll be the case, in fact, it's often the case for some simple, widely used kinds of criteria, that every time you merge two things, the cost of the merge will increase. So yeah. uh, if this is the distance, the cost is the distance. So. The dis so this is the distance between the merged pairs. Clearly, if you, if you merge these two pairs, right, if the next two pairs that get merged are a different pair, then it has to be larger. Because if it wasn't larger, you would have merged the other pair, you would have merged this pair instead of that pair, right? But over here, it could have been that you merge these two pairs, and then when you merge this with this, the distance was actually less. It could have actually gone backwards and been down here, right? But it typically isn't. In a lot, and for some cost functions, it's provably the case that every time you do a merge, the, the distance goes up. Does the horizontal line between the two dots reflect the distance after merging? Yes. So in other words, the yes. So this value, this this position here, maps to some point on this y-axis, and the y-axis here is the cluster distance. So when you compute the value of d i k. So this is one. This is cluster one and two. You merge cluster one and two. This is D one two. The value of D one two that was minimum among all the values is D one two was minimum among all the values because that's why you selected it. That's that. It corresponds to this point on this axis. That's why you see that these lines are at different positions. You know, sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. So you can, by this diagram, you get a lot of information. You can see you merge this first, and then you merge this, then you merge that, then you merge this, and then you merge that, and then finally you merge this. And when you're all finished merging, you only have one point, okay? So now what you can do is, this is kind of a handy dandy little diagram, okay? Because what you could do is you could do things like this. You might say, oh, well, how many clusters should I have? One possibility is you say, well, I should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I, maybe I should have seven clusters. Don't merge anything. Another possibility is I should have one cluster. Merge them all, okay? Those two extremes seem a little bit uninteresting, right? Because if you're gonna merge them all to, into one thing, why even bother having done the problem in the first place? You could just skip it, okay? <laughs> okay? And the same thing is essentially true for the case of not merging anything, right? So those two extremes are, are not usually so interesting, but uh, some place in between is typically interesting. And, and in fact, the best solution may depend upon your problem. Or you may want to maintain all the solutions so that you can kind of back up if you desire. So uh, the problem of figuring out when to terminate the merging process is known as order identification. Order identification is very important. Order identification. I wrote, just wrote this on the sheet of paper, but I can't. Uh, so, well, order identification. Order identification comes up in a lot of problems where you need to estimate not just the values of parameters for some model, but you need to estimate how many parameters to use. So an example would be if you're uh, you know, fitting a curve to data. Uh, like maybe we can switch over to the piece of paper. Okay, if you're <coughs> fitting a curve to data, you know, I'm sure you've been, uh, I hope you've had the experience of being in a, in a laboratory, like an undergraduate lab, and you know, you, you make some measurements to like verify Newton's laws and you plot over here. Here's you know, time and this is position or something like that, right? And now you have a plot like this. And at least when I was an undergraduate, the physics teacher really emphasized the fact they said, uh, 
under no circumstances should you just draw a lot uh, I mean oh wait under no circumstances should you I don't even want to do it okay well I'll do it with the blue I'll do it lightly should you do this that would be bad because you don't realize you don't really believe that's supposed to be Newton's law okay <laughs> okay because what you know it's, the data's got noise in it, okay? You measured it, you weren't paying too much attention, you were like telling jokes with your lab partner, and some of the points didn't get recorded right, or the ruler wasn't that accurate, or, you know, I don't know, whatever. There's noise, okay? So you don't do that. Instead, you say, well, you might say, well, I'm going to fit one straight line through the middle, okay? But maybe that's not quite right either. I didn't quite draw this so well. But, you know, maybe what, instead what you want to do is you want to say, okay, maybe it's like this, and then it's like that, you know? So the question is, the, the, when you have a curve that goes like this, that's a very high model order. You're basically assuming one, uh, you need a parameter for each new point, right? So you've got a lot of parameters to that model. You've oh, what's called overfit the data. You can fit any data if you left, let enough parameters, right? You just add one more parameter for each event, right? The other possibility is, is that, you know, here you may have underfit the data. The order in this case is very low order. There's only two parameters necessary for this model. Here you have more parameters. Here you maybe have say one, two, and then three. So you added more parameters. So the question is, well, what's the right number of parameters? If you use too many parameters, you'll get overfitting. If you use too far, far, few parameters, well, you won't you know, capture the essence of the data very well. It, uh, it turns out that this is closely related to the so-called bias variance trade-off, which I think I mentioned, right, in this class? Okay. Because uh, if you have too many parameters, you'll have high variance but low bias. So in other words, you're not biased here. You're just following the data exactly as it is. You know, it's like, well, how do you know that Martians landed and dropped a, a giant ball of green cheese on the ECE building last night? Well, my friend told me. Okay. So I'm completely unbiased. I'm very, I'm unbiased. I'm completely unskeptical. I just accept the information as told me, and I believe. Okay, I believe. Okay, but here, okay, here I'm like, well, uh, you know, here's the data on the gross national product of uh, the state of Indiana over the last three weeks, and you go, well, I don't believe it. <laughs> Okay, there you're highly biased. Okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, in one case, th this case you have low bias but high variance. In the other case, you have low variance but high bias. So there's a trade-off between those two things. It's one of the most fundamental trade-offs of information processing. Okay. So order identification requires is one of the ways in which you trade off bias and variance by trading off the number of parameters, the discrete selection of the number of parameters you use to specify, specify your model. It tends to be a fundamentally different problem than estimating parameters, like, for instance, you're trying to estimate the mean and variance, because it, the mean and variance is a continuous quantity and the model order tends to be discrete. You know, it's like a discrete number, okay? So one classic example of model order is when you're doing, going back to the computer, when you're trying to do segmentation, picking the number of regions. If you pick too many regions, you uh, overfit the data. If you pick too few, you underfit. And that's a very important problem. There's been a lot of uh, work done on it. It's uh, in some sense unsolved, and in some sense I don't think it will ever be solved, <laughs> because it's, a, it's not a problem per se that can be precisely solved, it's just a set of trade-offs that can be optimized. Okay, any questions? With that, I'll move on to the problem of, uh, we're going to move on to uh, uh, color image, uh, color, uh, like image perception 
and representation in color. Okay, I'm first, first, first start off with the achromatic case, and then I'm going to move on to the chromatic case. And, and, and I think one of the things I always like to start off with in this section is that, uh, maybe take the picture to me here, is that uh, one of the uh, uh, things that the engineers often feel uncomfortable with is uh, doing psychology, dealing with people. They feel like, well, people are subjective. Uh, you know, I like objective data, like measurement in inches or nanometers or whatever. So, uh, but humans are part of the engineering systems that we have to design for with images, because most images, ultimately, the consumer of those images will be people. They'll look at them. Okay, so we have to. When we ask the question of what's the overall performance of the system, according to any metric, we need to include the human in that loop in deciding. Uh, what the performance is. So, I mean, one possibility is to throw up our hands and give up. But generally, that, that, that option usually results in unemployment. So we usually don't select that option. Usually what we do is we say, okay, we have no choice but to plow forward and to do something innovative so we can keep our jobs, okay? And um, so then what we do is we say, okay, well, what are we going to do? Well, the logical thing to do is then to replace the, a human being by a linear space invariant system, okay? <laughs> Obviously, they seem just like linear space invariant systems. But, you know, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about engineering. You're forgiven for all your transgressions of modeling as long as you get an answer that's acceptable, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to see uh, how we can model uh, humans uh, and, of course, an important component of that model will not just be uh, some deterministic relationship, but it will also be probability, because any model we're going to have for humans is going to be pretty inaccurate. So, therefore, uh, we at least want to model how much variation we're going to get in the response uh, about our sort of mean response we might expect, okay? So, with that in mind, we're going to plunge into the world of human beings, and we'll switch over here to the computer. Um, I like to start off, now, okay, some people come into this the world of thinking that they understand something about color. Hold on. I can't, okay, this doesn't work the same as my computer. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is convince you that everything you know is wrong, okay? <laughs> so we get off onto a good start. Um, so I'm going to like show you some things. So I, I'll say things like I could I could say something like, um, you know, uh, your pers your ideas about perception of color are false. And and uh, okay. So first of all, let, let me uh, let's me start off by saying some things which you'll I'll, you'll say and you'll go yeah 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 sure 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 sure. But you won't believe me. And then I'm going to give you an example, and then you're going to be like really shocked, and then uh, you'll. Maybe still won't believe me, actually. I don't know. But anyway, okay, so uh, the objectives in this section are understand uh, contrast and how humans uh, detect changes of images, understand uh, photometric properties of the physical world, understand uh, the concept of color, the percept of color, and uh, learn how to use this understanding to design imaging systems. Okay, so, so the first section we're going to be really talking about contrast. Uh, which is fundamental to human perception, even outside of the area of imaging. It's really fundamental in all kinds of uh, responses, human responses to stimuli, okay? But, um, okay, now one of the things that's really important is that there's going to be two kinds of things, basically, that we're going to be modeling. When we're trying to model human responses, humans are actually responsing, responding to physical stimuli. Like, you know, if I touch you, okay, that's a physical stimulus, right? I mean, there's mechanical motion and energy transfer and all that good stuff, okay? And then it gets picked up by the nervous, uh, by some sort of a nerve, and then uh, it's sent to your central nervous system, and then your, uh, your brain processes it, and you have some perception, okay? So part of that modeling process is modeling the physical stimulus that obeys things like Newton's laws and the laws of physics. That part of the model is pretty well understood. In principle, you could sit down and write down a lot of very sophisticated equations that would give you a very precise model of exactly what's happening. Now, even there, you may want to make some approximations because it may not be very tractable to write down, uh, you know, um, 
the r laws of relativity for everything and you know solving Maxwell's equations in extremely fine detail okay so you may have some approximations but you have a very good handle on what the answer should be basically physical models that are exist today are precise enough to to calculate any uh, uh, measurement of that model to any degree of precision you desire, okay? Uh, you know, we don't need, like, for the most part, any sort of yet undiscovered uh, physical laws of the interactions of quarks, okay? It, you know, Newton's laws are, and uh, Maxwell's equations are pretty much good enough, so, okay? But where we get into problems is the human component. So now, Understanding color, the first thing you need to really understand is that color is not a physical property of the world, okay? So let me say that one more time. Color is not a physical property of the world. So you're going to say, well, that's kind of silly. I mean, he's just saying that. I'll remember, I'll write it down in my notes so that if you ask that question on the exam, I'll give him the answer he wants, but come on, I obviously don't believe that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So here, take the picture to me here. Can you shoot the picture of me? Okay, here, like this pen here. This pen is not red, <laughs> okay? <laughs> You're thinking, he's crazy, okay? <laughs> okay, the pen's not red, okay? Because redness is not a property of a pen, okay? <laughs> redness is a percept. It's a property of humans. Humans perceive things as being red, okay? So when I ask, is this red, what I'm really asking is, do you perceive it as red, <laughs> okay? Okay, so you'd say, well, okay, he's making ridiculous fine distinctions, okay? That make no, I mean, this is like, we can all start arguing about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Believe me, I'm a very concrete, get it done kind of engineering kind of person, okay? So this is not a fine distinction, okay? And now to prove you, to prove to you of the, this, okay? And he, there, of course you still don't believe me, but now I'm gonna show you why, okay, why this is true, okay? You ready? Okay, I know you don't believe me. Okay, so first I'll show you kind of a relatively subtle example, and then I'll show you a really ridiculous one where you'll, you'll, you'll it's this, your illusion is so strong that you're going to think I'm lying, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. so first, okay, which of these two blocks is darker? <laughs> okay. Okay, the answer is that there, the light being reflected on your, or the light being emitted on your screen from your display in these two blocks is the same. Obviously, this you perceive this to be darker than this, right? But if I go and look at this, the, they draw the straight lines here. You can see then, and if you squint, and actually, let's see. Uh, now, one of the things I'm going to hope I can do here, this is Microsoft Windows, so I can never trust. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if I can open this up and zoom in. See? Okay, that's one color of gray. Zoom in first. I guess you have to zoom in first. Okay. See, they're the same. Now you can do this experiment in the privacy of your own home. 
so you could verify that I'm not lying. Okay? But these two colors, which appear to be very different shades of gray, in fact, reflect, are, are emitting the same amount of light from your screen. So if you take a, if you take a quantitative scientific device and you measure the gray value there using whatever units you choose, the number of photons per candle, per stair radian, per light year, okay, or whatever, okay, you're going to get the same measurement at those two spots, okay. Now, so, so that's one problem. Now, uh, now, now, uh, okay, is this, uh, this is, I'm going to get rid of these, right? And I'm going to get this, okay. Now, now, I personally fix, feel like the next one is worse. Okay, so, uh, here we go. That's from the TED Talk I watched today. I know the guy who made that illusion. Okay, now. <laughs> what did it do? Oh, it keeps doing that to me. Now, and by the way, this is not a trick question. Okay, now, hold on, I gotta get this straight. I think, okay, so if I look at some, I don't even know what the, I'm cheating. I have to look at the answer, because I, you could po not possibly know, okay. Okay, <laughs> what color is that right there? Oh. That's yellow, right? Anybody will tell you that. It is yellow. The color there is yellow. Okay? You can get like a kindergartner to answer this question. They don't need to take 637, okay? Now, what's that color right there? Blue. That's blue, okay? How many people think that is not blue? How many people think that is blue? Okay? Admit it, we're weak, okay? <laughs> That's blue, okay? But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that those two colors are the same, okay? Hold on, let me zoom in. And just to make sure I haven't, like, entered some secret bugs into the program <laughs> or something, you can do this at home on your own computer. The weird thing is as you zoom in, then suddenly it turns from blue to a different color. Great. <laughs> that was the blue one, right? Now I'll do the yellow one. See, you probably think that I've modified this program so that as I zoom in, it changes the color, right? No, he's not that desperate for us to like him. Bum, bum, bum. Is that freaky or what? Uh -huh. Okay, so when I tell you that color is not a property of an object, I mean, this is clearly a proof of that. This isn't just a subtle, abstract point that we can argue about in philosophy. This is just <laughs> simply a fact, right? I mean, your observation of those two colors is different. Yet, the physical light being emitted from the surface of the screen at those two points is the same, okay? So color, so, okay, so from, from this we can immediately conclude that if your hope was that we were gonna be able to write down equations to tell us what color things were on the screen, that's going to be a very challenging task, okay? <laughs> okay, and in particular, 
it's hopeless to be able to determine what the color of a pixel is by actually looking at the values of RGB at that pixel. The values of RGB on the screen, you know RGB is, we're going to have red, green, and blue components that we can control to control the brightness of a pixel on the screen in the three components, right? But the values of RGB, RGB simply do not determine the color of the pixel, okay? I know that sounds very counterintuitive, but it's true, okay? So you'd say, well, what, what, what do they determine if they don't determine the color of the pixel, okay? Well, all, okay, they determine, okay, what, what we will be able to do is something much more modest than that. Now, the objective of color, of, of color imaging research, okay, is to be able to do things like determine the color of an object in a scene, okay? But, uh, that's a lofty objective, okay, that by and large is not achieved, okay, and is equivalent in complexity to do things like, you know, a, a goal of computer vision is to be able to look at a scene and interpret what's happening, right? That's the goal, but, you know, not many people can do it, okay, <laughs> okay? And in fact, they're equivalent because you can show with some simple experiments, as a matter of fact, it'd be fun to actually bring that experiment in, that a, a stark experiment much like this one, okay, that, uh, that your, your interpretation of the color of, a, of things in a scene is a function of how you interpret it from a high level. So it's not even just that you can process it in some kind of low-level way. You, if you're interpreting geometrically the scene differently, your perception of the color is different. So there's a connection between your high-level interpretation of the scene and the colors you perceive, okay? So trying to have a model of how people perceive color is extremely difficult. And beyond the scope of this course, we're not gonna do that, okay? Uh, uh, you know, I like to say that there's, uh, there's three stages to color. The first stage of color is that you think, you're probably in the first stage now, okay? The first stage of color is when you think that color is just like, well, heck, you know, you had images, they had gray levels, they were between 0 and 255, and now instead you have three numbers between 0 and 255. You have red, green, and blue, okay? That's the first stage of color. The second stage of color is that after you kind of get through this course, you're gonna learn about like how you do color transforms and things like that. And that's when you, if you can successfully execute those, those stages, then you're in the second stage of color, where you think, oh, well, you know, color wasn't just red, green, and blue. There's all these color transforms I have to do, and it's kind of nonlinear, and you have these, you have to do the calculations, and the matrices are a little complicated, okay? That's the second stage of color. The third stage of color is when you realize it's hopelessly complicated, and we'll never be able to solve it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, and it's just, you know, we're just naive if we think we can, okay? So, okay, I'm hoping to bring you first through the first two stages of color in this class, but, uh, so what we're going to do, actually, uh, well, first of all, we're not going to talk about color immediately. We're first going to go to the gray levels. But when we do co talk about color, the only objective we'll have is not to actually be able to determine what a color is, but determine when two colors look the same, okay? We won't know what they look like, but we'll just know, we'll be able to have uh, necessary, okay, uh, condition or no sufficient conditions to determine when two colors look the same. Okay, not necessary for the, but sufficient. Okay, so and, and we can go a long way with that because a display doesn't need to know what colors it's displaying. It just has to be able to produce a stimulus which reproduced your perception of some other scene. Okay, okay, and that's why RGB is very useful. But before we can go into any of that, we're going to first deal with the achromatic case. Okay. Um, oops, I think I closed the wrong thing. Uh, so we have a couple more. We have, oh, we have one more minute. So, uh, oh. So, um, I think with this, let me just say a little bit about where we're going to go. So, uh, the first thing we're going to do is the achromatic case. We're going to talk about the eye. One of the most important things about understanding color is understanding what the units are uh, for quantifying things. And when we're talking about the physical world, the unit that we're going to use as our basic reference is energy. Because when you're counting photons, 
the energy, uh, energy is proportional to number of photons. Remember, a photon's uh, uh, energy is proportional to its, uh, its frequency or inversely proportional to its wavelength. So uh, next time we'll, we'll dig into this in a lot more detail and I think you'll find this as a fun section of the course. Uh, see you next time, bye.